I think we need to get comfortable as a, as a culture in trying to understand our species and how we work, that the early stages of hard work and focus are gonna feel like agitation, stress, and confusion, because that's the norepinephrine and adrenaline system kicking in. Whether or not you can, you can eat a plant out of the ground that will magically put your brain into a state of plasticity. And the answer is yes, <laughs> such plants exist, uh -huh. but what's missing is the focus component. If that work is not done with a particular end goal in mind, you'll get plasticity, but you'll get plasticity in a kind of across the board. It's like learning nine lang learning a little bit of nine languages all at once is not gonna make you speak coherently in any one of them. So focus is the key. Bring about the most intense concentration you can to something, and then later bring about the least amount of concentration to that thing. What exactly is focus and what triggers plasticity? So the brain loves to be able to just do things, pick up coffee cups and drink and walk and talk and do things and not put much energy into it. When we decide to focus, what the brain really does is it switches on a set of circuits that involve the frontal cortex and nucleus basalis and some others. And it's trying to understand duration, how long something's gonna last, path, what's gonna happen, and outcome, what ultimately is gonna happen. So duration, path, and outcome. So for people that wanna change their brain, the power of focus is really the entry point and the ability to access a deep rest and sleep. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely clear that the nervous system can change in response to experience. So this thing we call neuroplasticity is really that. It's the brain's ability to modify itself in response uh -huh. to experience. And I think it's important to understand that from birth till about age 25, the brain is extremely malleable in a kind of almost passive way where kids are exposed to things and the brain is just wiring up. I mean, the brain is really designed to adjust itself uh, in order to be in concert with its surroundings. And so, the, the brain is basically designed to be customized in the early part of life, and then to implement those algorithms and that circuitry for the rest of, your, of its life. And so the brain can change in adulthood, and it can change provided that there's an emphasis on some perceptual event. If you wanna change your brain as an adult, let's say you wanna be less anxious, you wanna learn a new language, you wanna be more functional in some way, presumably. The key thing is to bring focus to some particular perception of something that's happening during the learning process. All day long, you're doing things in a reflexive way. But when you do something and you think about it very intensely, acetylcholine is released from basalis at the precise neurons that were involved in that behavior, and it marks those for change mm. during sleep or during deep rest later. Neuroplasticity is triggered by intense focus but neuroplasticity occurs during deep sleep and rest. And we had plasticity in the, in the adult brain, any age can be as robust as it is in childhood, as fast and as dramatic, wow. provided the focus is there and it's all contingent on this acetylcholine molecule coming from nucleus basalis. So these circuits in the brain that mother nature set up are designed to be anchored to a real need. And people always say to me, well, should I do something out of love and a real desire to learn or should it be out of fear? But either one works. The sense of urgency is just acetylcholine. Mm -hmm. It's norepinephrine. That's all it is. It doesn't, the brain doesn't have a recognition of whether or not something is pleasurable or not until later. Once you start accomplishing your goal, the reward systems like dopamine start kicking in. None of us would expect to walk into the gym and do our PR lift or you know, a performer go do something without warming up. The brain also needs to warm up and start to hone in which circuits are gonna be active. The dopamine system is mother nature's hardwired ancient system in all animals, including humans, to put us on the right path. Dopamine's main role is to be released anytime you achieve a milestone or you think you're on the right path. And when the dopamine system is tethered to a particular pattern of focus, remember duration, path, and outcome. So it's like, oh, you sit down, maybe you don't get much text out, but then the next day you get 800 words of really solid text and you feel good. You're like, I'm, I'm into this. What does that dopamine system do? The dopamine system takes the norepinephrine, which is normally rate limiting. Like at some point, there's so much norepinephrine that you quit. Dopamine can push that noradrenaline back down, that adrenaline back down and give you more room more space to do duration, path, and outcome work, highly focused work. Mm -hmm. And I'm making duration, path, outcome synonymous with highly focused work. So when we are on the right path and we hit a milestone, dopamine is released and it tends to tighten our focus more for that activity. 
just like the stress system is designed to get me out of bed in the morning. A cortisol pulse is what gets me out of bed in the morning. It's also what leads me to, or led me to pursue a career in science out of fear initially yeah. and eventually pleasure. So the dopamine system is tethered to those states of focus. And it's what mother nature designed so that the neural plasticity would occur and you would want to continue those behaviors again in the future. And the important thing to understand is when you start getting a convergence of norepinephrine, so that level of agitation, duration path outcome, acetylcholine, and dopamine, now you're starting to wire in the behaviors that make people really good at certain things. Now in a functional um, view of this, so not addiction, what this means is that for any of us, success in any endeavor is very closely related to how much focus we can bring to that endeavor. And the reward system you start to realize is entirely internal. No one's coming along and cramming dopamine in your ear or dripping it in your brain. It's all internal. And this starts to bring us into the kind of like discussion around mindsets. But the discovery of growth mindset was of these kids that actually really enjoyed doing problem sets that they knew they couldn't get right. But for them, they would get this like dopamine release from just focusing on the problem. They like doing puzzles they couldn't get right. It sounds crazy, but inevitably those kids are very good at puzzles and very good at math and on these kinds of things. So growth mindset is, I believe, if it's sort of a neuro neuroscience lens on growth mindset would be that the agitation and stress that you feel at the beginning of something and when you're trying to lean into it and you can't focus is just a recognized gate. You have to pass that through that gate to get to the focus component. And then if you can reward the effort process, you really start to feel joy and low levels of, of excitement in the effort process. That's that buffering of adrenaline. That's that feeling like, yes, I've got a lot of adrenaline in my system, but I'm on the right path. Mm. And when you start to bring that, those neural circuits together, you really start to create a whole set of circuits that are designed to be exported to any behavior you want. So if it's writing a book, great. If it's podcasting, great. If it's building a business, great. If it's, if it's you know, building a terrific relationship, great. Then the circuits that mother nature has designed are incredibly generic so that we could adapt to whatever it is that we need to do. And I think the misunderstanding around how these circuits work has led to this idea that there's some secret entry point maybe marked flow on the door. Mm -hmm. And there's a trampoline up to that door and you just mm -hmm. open that door and you're gonna be in it. <laughs> right. And yeah, yeah, nothing yeah. could be further from the truth. And anyone who's done well in any career or athletic pursuit knows this, but unfortunately there's a kind of obsession with the idea that it's all supposed to feel good. And it right. does feel good, but there's a whole staircase in which it feels kind of lousy. But work at the process of introducing thoughts as almost like you would introduce actions because we can introduce thoughts. And you know, positive self-talk is not the same thing as growth mindset because positive self-talk is almost always linked to the ultimate outcome. If I'm losing badly in something mm -hmm. and I tell myself I'm doing great, I know that I'm lying. Yeah, There's bullshit. no dopamine release right. from that. And you know, a lot of the self-help wellness culture of the eighties and nineties was like, it's impossible to be in a bad mood if you're smiling we wouldn't have any depression on the planet if that's true. There's probably some <laughs> feedback from the face to the yeah. brain, but it's not that simple. Uh -huh. But the idea that you can self reward the effort process is extremely powerful because what it means is that if you can recognize agitation, stress and confusion as an entry point to where you eventually wanna go, I do think that just that, even just mental recognition can allow people to pass through it more easily. They think they're doing something wrong. 